This is another update for my VR flight sim that I've made in Godot. To start, we've got some updates to object interaction. There's now keyboard and mouse compatibility for interacting with objects. Um, just using a Raycast, I can pick an object and place it in the uh, hand as hands are shared between VR and keyboard and mouse. This is really more of a prototype than anything, just an initial implementation to prove that it can work. As you can see, there's still some artifacts. When I move, the object doesn't match the hands perfectly, and that's because I'm using the character body node. This will be fixed when I change the character to use a rigid body node instead of the character body. I've updated the Subaru a little bit. Um, I added a trailer because I thought a trailer would be cool to haul around behind a car. I think it's an interesting demonstration of weight distribution as the vehicle's handling is influenced by the weight distribution of the trailer. Although it may not seem like it, trailers and airplanes have quite a bit in common. Weight distribution for both aircraft and trailers is very important. If you load a trailer with the weight resting behind the rear axle, you will have significant instability and oversteer. This is dangerous because if there is a road hazard that you need to avoid and you maneuver to avoid that object, you can be putting yourself into an overcorrection scenario and lose control. I figure because of this similarity and because I already have the Subaru in the game, it would be a cool experiment. There isn't very much gameplay value in this because my game isn't focused on ground vehicles or trailers or trailer maneuvers but I figured it would be something fun to try. A more interesting addition is that I've added propellers to my aerodynamics plugin. To demonstrate the propellers, I've created a simple F4U Corsair. The main reason I decided to develop the propeller class so soon is because I wanted to experiment with the emergent behavior of adverse yaw through means of P factor. P factor is a behavior of propellers when the propeller has an angle of attack. Because of this angle of attack, the airflow hits one side of the propeller at a steeper angle than the other propeller, and this causes there to be an imbalance in the lift force generated by opposing propellers. So here I show the debug vectors for the propeller and the propeller blades. As you can see, each blade is simulated individually. The propeller is based on a generalized aero rotator class that allows you to rotate any aero influencer. In the case of traditional propellers, that rotation gives you thrust and allows you to fly. The aero propeller class is quick and easy to iterate, allowing you to easily change the propeller amount. And the extended aero variable propeller class adds propeller pitch control on top of that. In total, all that's necessary to configure a propeller in my plugin is an aero propeller node with an aero influencer as its child. In my case, I used a manual aero surface. Pay attention to the configuration warning on the aero propeller node, as you must assign your single propeller blade in the aero propeller. The easiest way to line up the propeller blade is by moving it on the positive x direction until it no longer intersects the center of the propeller. The aero propeller node will automatically copy, rotate, and reposition this node for all blades that are needed. It's important to note that the radial symmetry of the propeller blades is on the y-axis, so for the propeller on an airplane, you'll need to rotate it accordingly. On the topic of propellers, I've also added a helicopter. This helicopter is supposed to be a Sikorsky UH-60 Blackhawk. It uses a different type of propeller, not only do you have a total pitch setting for all blades, but each blade's pitch can be adjusted throughout the movement path around the rotor. This is called cyclic control, and it's what allows pitch and roll control in helicopters. I also have a regular propeller with variable pitch as the tail rotor for anti-torque and yaw control. I'll show you some flight in VR. Um, it's definitely a better experience flying in VR because you have such fine granular control. You may or may not be able to tell, but I haven't implemented flapping hinges, which makes the helicopter impossible to fly at high speeds. 
This is because flapping and lead lag hinges are designed in helicopters to reduce the effect of asymmetric lift. One of the coolest and most entertaining additions that I've been working on is homing missiles. Shown here is a test scene with a moving target to display the uh, proportional response of the missile guidance. This missile is modeled to be an AIM-9L. The AIM-9 being one of the first guided missiles, and the AIM-9L being a variation designed in the 1970s. The simulation of this missile should be relatively realistic. Um, I've modeled how the seeker head shifts and turns. You can see that there at the front of the missile that represents the seeker head and which direction it's pointing. The fins on this missile do use the same aerodynamic simulation as everything else. I haven't skimped out and used fake physics or magical forces to guide the missile. As you can see here, you can see how the fins turn to point the missile in the right direction. One of the most important factors to the effectivity of this missile is proportional navigation. Rather than trying to fly directly towards the target, it tries to keep the target in the same line of sight instead, and the result will be a more optimized guidance path. One thing that's not very realistic about this missile that I have yet to fix is how much it rolls. In real life, the AIM-9 has what are called rollerons. They are control surfaces on the rear fins that use a stabilizing gyro to counteract roll. Here's a bit of a real-world scenario, launching missiles at uh, enemy planes that are flying and maneuvering. As you can see, they guide all the way to the target and explode. You may be able to notice that so long as a missile has tracking to a target, they will always hit the target because these targets aren't evading. I've actually gone to some detail um, coding the behavior for the tracking head on the AIM-9. It accounts not only for temperature, but also size, distance, and direction of the heat signature. These factors combined together means that there's emergent behavior in both the maximum tracking distance and also which target is tracked by the missile. This should allow for easy implementation of target spoofing, such as flares or leading missiles into the sun. An example of target spoofing that may be encountered in the current version can happen when two jets are close enough together that one jet's heat signature overrides the signal from the other. However, it's not very effective for target spoofing if you just train the missile onto your teammate. I did end up making some more changes to the flight control computer. I had found that a few of the ways that I was tuning and adjusting for different variables was incorrect. I was having continued issues with overcorrections, undercorrections, vibrations, deep stalls, and a number of other artifacts from the flight control. This led me to do a little more research into the F-16 flight computer. I found a book by Carl S. Drost and James E. Walker called The General Dynamics Case Study on the F-16 Fly-By-Wire Control System. If you are interested in the technical details of how the F-16 flight control computer works, I would highly suggest reading this book. It goes into great detail not only about the math, but also the mechanics of the flight control computer and the flight control actuators. One of the issues I found was with the angular rate tracking PIDs. Um, my use of derivative gain wasn't helpful. I believe this is because airplanes are naturally dampened kinematic systems and so the derivative gain was causing more problems than it was solving issues. I had also found that the way that I was adjusting for airspeed was interfering and overlapping with my G limiter causing controls to be inconsistent at different speeds. There are still a few outstanding issues with the flight control. One of my biggest concerns is the time it takes to reach the G-limiter. This footage probably isn't a very good example of it, but it can take a couple of seconds to hit 9 Gs fully. And I found that in some cases, even with adequate airspeed, the airplane would never pull to the G-limiter. I believe this may just be an issue with how the integral error accumulates 
and it may be possible to remove this issue through further tuning. The final and most crucial feature that I've worked on since my last devlog is the far view. If you recall from the last video, I had the split rendering working for flat screen, but it was incompatible with VR due to my use of the sub viewport container. Sub viewport containers are UI nodes, so they work through the 2D compositor. Because XR rendering is a special case, none of the 2D environment is rendered for XR. This is a very major issue for my project as it relies heavily on long view distance and long engagements. The way I've decided to solve this problem is rather than using a sub viewport container, I instead use a full screen quad which covers the entire screen and I can apply a render texture to this quad. This allows me to feed in the render result of a separate camera to be displayed inside the 3D view. This has one extra benefit in that it reduces how many times we have to re-render the world. Rather than rendering both eyes once for the regular view and once for the far view, which would total four renders, we only have to render the far view in a single monoscopic render. We aren't quite out of the woods yet. Because XR has two separate renders, and each eye doesn't render quite the same position, we can't directly map that render texture to the screen. What I found after some help from the Godot community is that you need to use something called normalized device coordinates. This is basically a fancy way of saying instead of basing something off the camera, you're basing it off of the view direction. This was a brilliant success and a huge step towards our final goal. However, there was still one glaring issue. A known issue when trying to create double renders in XR in Godot is that it's impossible to get the most current headset information in XR. This is because the headset position isn't updated until immediately before the rendering actually takes place. This means that no matter what we do, the render result of the far view will always be one frame behind the actual VR render. This may seem like the end of the world, but this is where Godot's true superpower comes into play. Due to Godot's open source nature, I can modify the engine to fix this bug myself. I was able to find a fix, implement it, and recompile the engine, which ended up resolving my problem outright. Finally, we have an expected result for our far view. There are still a couple of ways that I need to improve this far view. The editing experience for my project isn't very easy when you can't see long enough distances in the editor. Modifying the far view so that it can run in the editor would be very useful. The other shortcoming is that it's not very easy to determine the field of view or the total render resolution of the VR view because the two eyes have overlapping rendering. This isn't a total loss because we can determine the field of view through trial and error. However, there is yet another hidden utility of this far view solution. Being able to identify targets, buildings, or enemy aircraft at long distances is very important. The ability to render the far view at a higher resolution than the VR headset will be extremely useful for these cases, as we can super sample as to not lose visual of those long distance objects. What I have done here is I've configured the far view to render at an extremely low resolution to show just how much the far view helps in game. The final product works even better than I had anticipated. You can now download my aerodynamics plugin straight from the Godot asset library. Releases are also available directly on my GitHub. I've also started a Discord server for my projects. If you need help with my plugin or you just want to join in the fun, consider joining. Links for both are in the description. Do consider liking this video and subscribing if you'd like to see future updates on my project.